title of my sermon is Praise the Lord Your God. Uh, the scripture that we just read is the uh, last chapter of First Chronicles, which if you are reading scripture uh, following with the church schedule, um, this is today's reading. Um, it's a prayer, actually. The first part is uh, David's prayer when finally uh, the temple, uh, the Ju- temple of Jerusalem, uh, has uh, been all set, ready, uh, not built yet. Um, but he is um, giving thanks to everything that God has done. But before we go to the final chapter of uh, First Chronicles, let's just zoom out and try to grasp the big picture of what uh, First and even Second Chronicles means. If you're reading um, scripture, <clears throat> First Chronicles may be a challenging book because from uh, chapter 1 to 9, it's like all genealogy and names and maybe you just want to give up reading or something like that. Um, but if you just pass through that, uh, you recognize, hey, I already read this in Second Samuel or maybe uh, First Kings or Second Kings, and you see a repetitive narrative that is recorded here. And so you're asking, it's, we already uh, read um, Second Samuel, First uh, and Second Kings. Why is there another re- record about the same events? Well, this is where uh, we have to understand that there is a reason for every book that is in Scripture. And I just want to give a brief uh, overview of the meaning of Chronicles. People don't actually know who wrote the Chronicles. Um, Conservative people think maybe it's Ezra, uh, who is the leader, one of the leaders who uh, came back from the uh, Babylon exile and through the edict by um, Cyrus, they came back and they're going to rebuild the temple. And uh, Ezra, you know, he established what it means to be a true uh, people of God. Okay? He reinstates the law that was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. And uh, he is very uh, serious that we will keep to all of the laws of God. Um, but mainly we don't have, uh, we really don't know. So scholars just call the author the chronicler, okay? Uh, so that's just a name that was given by uh, the scholars. Um, it, some of the stories uh, are overlapping. <clears throat> um, First Chronicles almost kind of equates with Second Samuel because it's mainly about David. And um, Second Chronicles, it's... Uh, First Kings and Second Kings all together. So you have Solomon, story of Solomon, and then you have the other kings after um, the kingdom had been divided. But there's a, a stark difference. For instance, in Chronicles, you don't have any narratives, specific narratives of the northern king. Northern kings, they're all left out. And if you read Chronicles, even though it's very similar, um, hey, wait a minute, David, Solomon, you know, they, didn't they kind of mess up? Didn't David have an affair with Bathsheba? And then because of that, you know, <clears throat> there was like judgment upon his family. And what about Absalom? And, you know, there was a coup and all these things. You don't have that in Chronicles. Okay. It seems like in Chronicles, they want to leave all the negative stories of David out, and you just have the good parts, okay, very highlighted. And even for Solomon, you know, in the end, Solomon, you know, he was wealthy and everything was going okay, so um, he had a thousand wives, right? And then he married, inter, 
national marriages with other nations, and because of that, he brought in uh, idol worship. You don't have that in Chronicles, okay? And even for the uh, kings, it's mainly the kings of uh, southern Judah, um, like even for Manasseh, you know, this was the king that in, uh, if you read uh, from second, second Kings, uh, first and second Kings, um, this is why God wanted to destroy, right, Jerusalem and just his people. But in Chronicles, you even have Manasseh repent, right? And then God is so pleased and look at <laughs> repenting Manasseh. You even have that. So it seems like you want to erase all of the bad stuff and then you want to bring in the good parts of everyone. Another interesting thing is, especially in the whole narrative of First and Second Chronicles, there seems to be something that is very, very deeply specifically recorded. And it's about the temple, David, um, how he prepared everything, the preparation and all of the Levites who's going to um, take part in the service, who's going to do what. It's very, very specific. And you have a long narrative of that. And then Solomon finally building uh, the temple. So David and Solomon, uh, these two kings are very highlighted here. And then there is a repeated record of the so-called Davidic covenant where one day, you know, David is king and then he couldn't sleep. So he's saying, hey, I'm living in a palace made of Siddhar and the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, it's in a tent, you know, I can't stand it. And then God sends Nathan and he blesses David, right? You want to build a house for me? David, look, I'm going to build you a house. I will build you an eternal kingdom, right? That, this is the Davidic covenant. It's going to be an eternal kingdom from your offspring. Um, so the covenant is very important. So, and then you have from chapter 1 to chapter 9, starting from Adam, all the genealogies. You know, to us, is, this is kind of very boring, you know. What is, do I have to read this? If you read it very fast, someone might, you know, think you're speaking in tongues or something. Like, it's really a very long chapter here. So what's it about? Well, the Chronicles are very important. And this is a rewriting of a story, the story of God, the people of God, and it has a perspective. You know, every history uh, book has a perspective. Nothing is neutral, okay? Um, you know, are you going to write history mainly saying that everything is influenced by high-powered kings or supreme leaders. You know, that's basically how all of the history is written, right? Or are you going to write from, you know, this is a grassroots thing, you know? What are the common majority of people? How did they live and how did they change and structure how the world is going on? Or do you have like a godly perspective? Christians like to look at everything at a godly perspective. Well, Chronicles is basically a godly per perspective given to especially the exile who returned back to their homeland. Okay? And for them, think about that. They've lost the land. Okay? They were exiled to another nation. Um, for 70 years, they couldn't come back home. They have uh, been exposed to other cultures, other idol worship. Lifestyle had changed. A whole generation did not experience temple worship in Jerusalem. Now suddenly they came back and they rebuilt the temple, okay, uh, hoping 
that everything now, we're going to come back as King David or King Solomon. But the temple itself, if you read Ezra and Nehemiah and prophets, it wasn't as glorious as the temple of Solomon. And then even after building the temple, you know, they don't seem like they're in the center of the world, right? They're not the center of the world. It's still their superpowers powers going, right? After uh, Persia, now you're going to have uh, Alexander come in, and then after that, Rome. And all these superpowers are playing, but Israel, even they, though they came back, they built the temple. It's like, what are we? What is this? So Chronicles gives a perspective to these people, okay? They go back all the way to Adam from the beginning of time, from the beginning of creation, from the beginning of everything. And then when the chronicler is writing down Adam, Seth, Enosh, and all of these names, the genealogies, it's making a brief historical record by just writing down the names of important people and telling the people, you know what? Let's start from the beginning. This is how everything is going. And in this story, the chronicler wants to give the people hope. Okay? History can give us hope for the future. Okay, because the kingdom of David and Solomon is not just a story that happened, you know, hundreds of years ago to them. It was a story because that is going to be a model for the coming messianic kingdom. And for you guys who came back from exile who built this small Zerubbabel temple, and you seem, so now what? You're asking this question. Now where you're going to go? God is giving them a new hope through the written chronicles so that they understand who they are, who God is, what God is trying to do, and what they should do, okay, and act. Okay, so they're, they're going to be given a vision and hope by the hope of a messianic kingdom that was modeled through the kingdom of David and Solomon. So in that sense, the chronicles, even though, you know, you have similar stories from um, Samuel and uh, Kings, the book of Kings, it's a very different perspective. First and second Samuel, first and second Kings, okay? Scholars want to call this, his, the, it's a history based on Deuteronomy, okay? So the prophets wrote it. It's like they're, got, they're, going, they're going to look at the story, for instance, David, okay? Did he live by the law of Moses that is written in Deuteronomy? Okay? Did he obey the law? And then they're going to make a comment for each king. He lived like David. So, good king. No, he walked the way, not of David, right? But maybe of Saul or Rehoboam or Jeroboam, the bad guy. So, they're going to mark good, bad, good, bad. And it's all based on did they follow the law or not? And basically, what um, the first and second kings is saying, yeah, they all messed up. The end. Period. <laughs> okay? That's the uh, judgment that is poured upon the people. And I want you to bring that in uh, perspective because when we are living the life of a Christian, when we are given the gospel message here, we sometimes want to evaluate ourselves like, this. Okay, did I live up to the word of God? Mm, 
good, maybe bad, maybe medium, okay? <laughs> maybe middle. Or you want to judge, how about that person? Oh, did uh, Pastor On or some of the elders, how do, they, how, do, how do I evaluate them? Are they, are they good? Are they holy? One out of ten? Mm, I don't know. Okay. The message of the Chronicles brings in the perspective of the gospel. That's why this is very important. Think about this. Um, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, they evaluate everybody according to the law. And if they're pretty good, good king. Pretty bad, bad king. Okay? But in the chronicler, the message is not about how the kings reacted, but it's more about what God is trying to do. And the whole message is basically based on the covenant that was made between David, God is faithful. And from Adam until now, until the people were exiled and then they came back to Judah, and they're rebuilding back their community, don't forget, God is always faithful to the covenant. He is building his kingdom, the messianic kingdom that is to come, and let's hope, and we had a model here, it's like the kingdom of David, it's going to be like the days of Solomon, and we're going there. And it is because, not that we were faithful, but because of God's saving grace, we are here. And therefore, God is going to lead us to the true messianic kingdom. It's all about what God is doing. So if that is true, let's focus on, hey, did you live up to the law or not? Is that person living up to the law or not? Let's not have that perspective. Let's just worship the Lord, praise his faithfulness, praise his mighty name, acknowledge that he is the one who is initiating everything, and let's all come to worship him. Therefore, rebuilding of the temple stories give meaning to the returned pre-exiled, right? Now they're post-exiled community, which gives hope because God is so faithful to the covenant that was made to David. He will never give up. He will always, always take care of us. And no matter how messed up we are, God is going to love us and he will lead us to the messianic kingdom. And therefore, let's come, celebrate, worship the Lord. Let's give thanksgiving. Let's pray to him. Let's offer everything to the Lord. And, and, and that is very, very well expressed in the prayer of David. Okay? So now we're going to go into uh, the prayer of David. Um, from verse 10, David, you know, he made all these preparations. If you read uh, 1 Kings, um, you don't have uh, a very specific detail of what David did. But in the Chronicles, you know, he did so many things. He prepared uh, the stones. Uh, dressed stones, and in chapter 22, you have iron and bronze for the nails. You know, it has a detailed uh, uh, scripture saying, well, David even prepared iron, you know, iron nails, and even bronze ones. And then Sidar logs he imported from Sidon and Tyre, and then uh, how much gold, you know, uh, David put in. He said 100,000 talents of gold. Okay, this is like unfathomable amount of gold. And then a million talents of silver. 
and then workmen, stonecutters, masons, carpenters, men skilled in every kind of work. You have a very detailed. And what's interesting is he even had the plans, you know, a detailed blueprint of how the temple is going to be built. And the chronicle says it was given by God. Okay. So he's kind of like Moses who received the plans for the tabernacle and then he's going to give it to the community and this is how God wants to be worshipped. Uh, David is doing the same thing. Well, I received the plans for the temple and then he's going to hand it over to Solomon, build it like this. This is what God wants the temple to look like. And then precious stones and everything. Very, very detailed. And what's more in detail is who's doing what. You have all the names of the Levites, who's going to be the singers, who's going to be the gatekeepers, who's going to be the priest, and who's going to take charge of things. He had everything outlined. Just he couldn't do it. God wanted Solomon to do it. And then all the leaders, they were so happy with this enterprise. They joined in. They were giving offerings after offerings. And then you have that in chapter 28 and 29. And then finally, David is giving a prayer of thanksgiving. So here's the prayer. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. And in this prayer, we find out who God is, right? Praise be to uh, praise be to you, O Lord. And then David uh, describes uh, from verses uh, 10, the latter part, to verse 12, who God is. Greatness, power, glory, majesty, splendor, everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom you are exalted as head over all. Lord, you are a great, great God. Wealth, honor. You know, if you look at how much that David and the leaders like gave to the Lord, we're, we're going to go, wow. But David is saying, wealth, honor comes from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. True worship is worshiping the true God. And David is calling the uh, post-exilic community to come back to true worshiping the true God. And he is teaching them I want you to confess who God is. God is great. He is mighty. He is God over heaven and earth. He is in control of everything. All wealth and honor comes from him. Come to the Lord. And then he teaches them. A true worshiper knows God, not only knows God, but gives thanks that's going to be our response of a true worshiper. We give thanks. Your lips, your mouth, you should restore the thanksgiving to the Lord. Where is it? So in verse 13, he says, Now our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. In worship, we acknowledge who God is, but at the same moment, we acknowledge who the worshiper is, who we are. And this is what David is saying in verse 14. But who am I? Who am I? And who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? What's the answer to who am I and who are my people? Well, David gives the answer in verse 15. He, he says, we are aliens and strangers. What's an unusual uh, word selection for David? What? 
don't we have our country? Aren't we like, you know, gonna build a temple? Our, our, isn't our country great enough now? But why did David say, we are aliens and strangers in your sight? Because that's the identity that the exiled people had for 70 years. We were aliens and strangers in a land. They exactly knew what that meant. As were our forefathers, our days on earth like a shadow without hope. Okay. In David's words, it may mean to like, you know, the ancestors from Abraham, Isaac, and uh, Jacob, but to the post-exilic community, it was them. Yeah, we, we were like that. Yeah, we had no hope. Our days, you know, living in Babylon, living in Persia, kingdoms come and go, but where are we going? Where's God? Did God desert us? You know, all of these thinkings. But they finally came back. But still, they understand this totally. And then he goes back to the abundance of giving that they had made now. He says, O Lord our God, as for all this abundance that we have prov provided for building you a temple for your holy name, it comes from your hand and all of it belongs to you. This is the attitude of a true giver. You're not giving, eh, I have a hundred, okay, I, I have family to provide, I have to work about this, and then you divide everything. Oh, this is how much I have left, and therefore, maybe I could give the Lord this much. This is not coming from a true worshiper. True worshiper comes from this. We have given you only what comes from your hand, right? In verse 14, it comes from your hand and all of it belongs to you. A true worshiper's heart when giving confesses this and knows this as a reality. You're not doing it because it's a duty. You're doing it out of pure expression of how great God is, and you know that all wealth, all honor, everything comes from the Lord, and what you have now is from what God has provided for you, and therefore you give it to the Lord. This is the heart of the true worshiper who gives to the Lord, knows that it comes from the Lord. We may say it, but that doesn't mean we really mean it, right? And, and God is looking into the hearts of a true worshiper, and he sees that. And then he says in verse 17, okay, from, uh, I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All of these things have I given willingly and will honestly intent, and now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. A willing heart, a heart of integrity. This is what God seeks to the people who gives. Not the amount, but what attitude they're coming when they're giving. And then from 18 to 19, it's a supplication. This is what God, uh, David wants from God. And, and it's very interesting. Oh Lord, God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, keep this desire in my hearts of your people forever. He's asking a desiring heart for you. Keep it. Keep it in my heart. And keep their hearts loyal to you. The exilic community, the people who were exiled, they know that they could never live up to the law of God. First and second Kings explains that. The prophetic perspective says, yeah, no one can live up to the law. The exilic community using David is saying, this should be our prayer. Let's pray that our hearts be a desiring heart for the Lord. Let's pray that our hearts be loyal 
to the Lord. Heart change, a heart transplant cannot come from us. It has to come from you, O Lord. And it, this ties directly to um, <clears throat> Jeremiah and Ezekiel's you know, a new heart, right? A new covenant, all of this, it connects together. And then he asks that you bless Solomon, okay? And give my Sol- uh, son Solomon the wholehearted devotion to keep your commands. They know. David and Solomon messed up too. But they're using this example, a model of the Messianic kingdom, to hope that in the future Messianic kingdom, now because God is going to give them a new heart, a transplant, with God is going to change, and we will have a desiring heart for the Lord, now the true Messiah, okay, When he rules, he will show us what true devotedness means. And we know through the story of Jesus that he was obedient even until death. And when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, when the Holy Spirit comes and we let the Holy Spirit lead us and we let Jesus reign our lives, we see the power of the Spirit compelling us to be obedient to the Word. This is the power of the gospel. And then David said to the whole assembly, this is not my prayer, but our prayer. So, Praise the Lord your God. And everybody just bow down. This, this is our prayer. This is our prayer. This is the message that I want to um, give. Okay? Since you kind of have a gr- uh, glimpse of what Chronicles is compared to First and Second Kings and uh, First and Second Samuel. why they are going back to the heart of worship, okay? It's because that this is going to be the only response that is acceptable to true people who hope in the messianic kingdom that is to come. This is the only response that God would take to true people who accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, who believe Jesus as their Lord and Savior, which is a worshiping heart, a life of worship, true worship, not just in our time, 9 a.m. here, but a worshiper, a true worshiper who acknowledge who God is, who recognizes who they are, And who knows that God's kingdom has already started and is going to come. And therefore, our attitudes toward everything is in believing who God is and what he has done through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Chronicles highlights the temple. But remember Jesus said, he is the temple. And this is also the vision of the coming of the new heavens and earth in uh, Revelation and also the new Jerusalem. Okay? In uh, Revelation 21, verse 22, Apostle John, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So when we read Chronicles, it's not about building a church building. It's not about building a physical temple. It's about restoring the kingdom through the hope that is given 
within the church, which is the body of Christ. And this only happens when we let the Spirit of Jesus, which is the Holy Spirit, indwell, empower, guide us in our lives. Isn't that why in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, 3.16, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you. When we read Chronicles, it's a God perspective that God is faithful to the covenant of David, which is establishing the eternal kingdom, which is the kingdom of God that is already here, but not yet, but we're going that way. And Jesus is saying through the gospel, we ourselves become temples of the Spirit. And therefore, when we read chronicles of David's specific preparation and the heart toward the temple, God is saying to us, I have planted in that heart through the Holy Spirit. Let it shine through your life. Let it be exposed to people around you. Show them that Jesus reigns in our life. Live out as true temples that are to be built. Okay? And that should be the image of who we are. And the ultimate goal is to go to the new heavens and new earth, and there will be a new Jerusalem, and there will be an ultimate temple over there, and Revelation says, it's the Lord God Almighty, and the Lamb is my temple. Where we are all one, created anew, within a new heavens and earth, given the full identity within God that we are the temple. I want to conclude. Chronicles teaches us who we are, where we are going, who God is, what he has done in the perspective of the gospel, and therefore how we should live. And it calls us to have a desiring heart for worship. And brothers and sisters, I want to invite you in prayer because this is where we are. This is who we are. And this is where we are going. Let's pray to God and ask for his guidance and uh, pray along with the prayer of David. Let's pray and just exalt the Lord, proclaim who God is. Let's give thanksgiving to the Lord and ask God to give us a desiring heart to be a true worshiper to the days to come. And that is the fulfillment of his kingdom. Let's pray together. Father God, because of the saving grace and the gospel of our dear Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we are given a new perspective of everything. From Adam until now, all men fail before your law. We cannot live up to your standards. We can never live up to your standards. The Old Testament story teaches us we are all but sinners in need of a Savior. But through Chronicles, you also teach us that you have always been faithful from Adam until now. Even though we mess up, you gave us hope 
You gave us a promise, a covenant that will be everlasting and you are ever so faithful. Even though we sinned and we were exiled, we were, we were forsaken, you bring us back because of your promise and because of your faithfulness and we hold on to that. Thank you for the message of the gospel, redeeming of our sins, bringing back to us the heart of worship. Let us never forget who we are worshiping to, who we are, and where we are heading ultimately. And that our response to that is just worshiping you, O great and almighty, everlasting Lord. We pray the prayer of David. We exalt you. We give you thanksgiving. And we ask that your spirit help us to continuously have a desiring heart for you. Oh Lord, bless each one of us and help us to worship you with all our heart, mind, and soul. In your name we pray.